Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever-blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and that sometimes messy thing we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Milu, the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit Milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are back for another episode here at the Boca Podcast, and uh, I'm glad to have you here today, whether you're listening in the car or at home or whatever you may be doing. I hope you're not editing, but I've got a, you know, Chip, actually, I guess I I would say a longtime friend. You feel like a longtime friend. Chip Gillespie is here from our wonderful photography industry, from Stomp Software and Chip Gillespie Photography. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. Oh man, it's my pleasure. I, I, I agree with you. I feel like there were a few years where we just kind of floated around one another, and then we we finally found the right mutual friend. And it's just been uh, it's been good to to get to know you better over over the last several years. Yeah, man. And I and I didn't say this to you before we started recording, but I'll, I'll say this on air for everybody's sake. You are one of the few people in our industry. It, it's not something that happens really, not just even in our industry, but in life in general, where you get a chance to meet somebody and they have this look in their eyes of genuine kindness. Um, and, and you just kind of want to give him a hug and, and that's you truly. And, and I really appreciate that. Whatever you do that encourages that, that behavior, that attitude, that mentality, keep doing it because we need more of that. But I have to give you props for that before we get started here. Man, I, I don't know if you can see it right now. I'm blushing. That's been <laughs> very kind of you to say, no, thank you. I, uh, I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, it's certainly not a compliment that I just throw out there randomly. I really appreciate your kindness and, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Stomp Software toward the end of our episode. Uh, sure. We're going to also talk a little bit about your photography business. In fact, let's just jump into that first. Um, you are a photographer to begin with. Your your focus has kind of veered more in the direction of overseeing Stomp in more recent, in the last year, year or so. But your photography business, you're based in Texas. Talk to us a little bit about your brand position. And, uh, and for those of you listening in, we talk about brand position a lot here in the podcast, but if you're new, very simply, a brand position is that thing that your business stands for that separates you from your so-called competition in your market. So what would that be for you, Chip? Sure. This one, this one's a, a bit of a tough one for me. Just, I, I, I don't find it easy to talk about myself, but as an independent photographer, my brand position is, is sort of me, my, my personality right? Like couples are maybe initially drawn to me because I, I make pretty pictures. I, I do good work, sure. but they, they like me. They, they refer me to their friends and family. They hire me again for portraits and such because of the experience that I give and, and, and the way that we click on a, on a personal level, right? So they can, you can find a good photographer, lots of places, but we find that folks come, come back to us and, and send us their friends and family because they just love being around us and that sounds super egocentric and i i hate that no no um, no. I, I don't think so and it, and it's it is a i mean this is an interesting point of conversation for me in general we, we talk about this a lot in the podcast largely because i think there's an opportunity to it's not a point of discussion in our industry a whole lot mm. there there is quite a bit of conversation about the significance of selling ourselves or our brand essentially being a mirror of ourselves. And I get that thought process. The caveat to that, and one of the reasons that I like to focus on this this question in the podcast is because there are so many photographers out there. Um, mm. where, whereabouts are you based in Texas? Uh, so I'm, I'm about a half an hour north of Houston. Of Houston, okay. So r- relatively large city, large number of people, probably a large population of photographers. Yes. And so the, the question then is what would set you apart from those photographers? And that's, and you know, maybe it's just a kind of a point of conversation and consideration. There's no doubt that you as a photographer, nobody's going to be able to replicate you. And, and I mean, to my earlier point, your personality is one that's naturally going to draw people in. I can see how they're naturally comfortable with you. Uh, but for everybody sure. listening in, again, the, the purpose of this question is to at least encourage some thought about, all right, so I naturally I'm going to sell myself because nobody can replicate me. But what's the initial 
What's the initial hook? What is that that value proposition that that brings somebody in? When they say, you know, Nathan Holritz photography, for example, what does Nathan do? He's a wedding photographer. Okay, that's cool. But I know, you know, 10 other wedding photographers. Nathan Holritz photography, he photographs, and I think I've used this example before, but black and white weddings for skateboarders. Now we're getting really, really specific and I'm doing something, right. I'm offering a service that actually sets me apart from my so-called competition in, in the industry. We may be friends and share and that's all great. But at the end of the day, if they see a Facebook ad come across about a wedding photographer, how am I setting myself apart and how am I doing that in you know, just a few words or a sentence? And that's the thought process behind uh, the brand position. So I just want to get, give context to that for everybody listening in. But I have to, to reiterate uh, the point that I made earlier, which is certainly nobody can mirror you or replicate you and uh, your personality is one that naturally draws people in. How would you say that people are, is it, is it a word of mouth referral that they're finding you and hearing about your personality and then as a result, scheduling a meeting with you? Uh, yes. And, uh, so I started shooting weddings in 2006 okay. uh, for a studio in town and 2011, early 2011, we started our own studio, my wife and I. And since that point, uh, I mean, I, I should have an exact percentage. Well over 80% of our couples have found us through a friend or family wow. or through direct referral. And, and that's been a huge blessing. I got babies to feed, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> it keeps the lights on, you know, it's, it's, it. <laughs> it's been, and, 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 and of course the, the added benefit is oftentimes you'll see past couples, past brides and grooms at, at, at future weddings and, and that sort of thing. And, and it just like, it really uh, well it makes it makes for a, a real fun time, but but the the word of mouth referral has definitely been the strongest uh, for us in our business. That's cool, and eighty percent. I mean, that says so much. And and now we know that what I'm saying and complimenting you is not fluff. I mean, people are realizing this, and that that is huge. At the end of the day, it, it is about our personality, and that personality hopefully translates to an experience that we're creating for our clients. Um, that will naturally encourage those those word of mouth referrals. So uh, thanks for setting that example for us. That standard 80% is huge, Chip. And uh, I think that's really awesome. Let me jump to the next question, though. And you mentioned, sure. I, th I think you said you started in 2006. Is that right? That's right. So uh, you're, you're in business now for, let's say, about 13 years. That's quite a while. And props to you for being able to actually stay in business for that long. That's not something that everybody can claim. But what would you say is one of the biggest lessons that you've learned as a business owner? This could be through Stomp or um, through your wedding photography business. What comes to mind? Sure. Well, let, let's, I guess let's, let's talk wedding specifically. It's, it's maybe a hard lesson initially, but I would say choose your clients wisely. Like don't, don't chase every wedding that comes along. Mm. There's a temptation, especially early on to book every single couple who darkens your door. And I think it's important to learn to resist that a bit. Finding like-minded clients, finding clients with whom you have a shared vision and an understanding is so important to well, both to them being just elated with their, with their photos and you feeling satisfied that they brought you in because they trust you to do the job and that you weren't just a hired hand with a, with a trigger finger sort of thing. Did you learn this kind of the hard way? I mean, was it, did you run into some situations where you're like, yeah, sure. And then you regretted it? When I, when I first started doing weddings, I shot for a studio. It was a phenomenal experience. I learned a whole lot real fast. In that season, in, in the 2006, 2010 season, uh, it was a volume-based studio. Uh, we had, a, we had a, a sales manager who would do all the client consultations. And so there were lots of times when I would show up to a wedding with a, hey, I'm Chip, I'll be your photographer today. And so while that business model and that structure worked uh, really well for that business, yeah. when, when the wife and I decided we were going to start uh, break off and launch our own business, we decided we wanted a very different experience of things, both for ourselves and for our, our clients. I'm a fairly emotionally driven person when it comes to my, my interpersonal relationships. And so when it comes to a wedding, I, I want to feel like I know the people that I'm photographing so that I can feel that I'm authentically telling their, their love story, their wedding story. Yeah. Um, and, and I feel like when, for the client's experience, when they have the same sort of feel about me, then it, it's much less like, uh, oh, there's that guy we hired to take some photos right. for us. But it's more like, oh, Chip's here. Uh, hey, Chip, come on in. Th these are my bridesmaids. These are my groomsmen. Yeah, that's my cousin, Mike. He's the one I told you about. You know what I mean, and it, and it's it's more like an old friend with with a couple of really nice cameras is is joining the party 100%. more than more than this vendor just showed up. And so for us, we we spend a lot of time with our brides and grooms before the wedding day, 
So we, we've, since, since we began, we've set a cap on how many weddings we're willing to take each year. And that number has fluctuated. Um, typically not, not much up. Like we haven't, uh, we've wanted to make sure that we, um, both had time to devote to those relationships and also had time that we weren't spending every waking moment with our, with our wedding clients. So we, we've got a couple of kids and we'd like to see them as well. <laughs> so, believe it or not. He says nonchalantly. So, yeah, no, I, I, I totally get that. So it wasn't like horror stories necessarily that, that helped guide that piece of, of advice I would give, but more so that, man, you mentioned a minute ago, 13 years is a long time in this industry. Like, I feel like most folks sort of hit their tipping point or, or their, uh, their get the heck out moment about four to six years in. Mm. And we have, we've just never been at a point where we're like, Oh my God, I have to get out of here. I can't do another freaking wedding. We've never been there. And I think it's, it's because uh, perhaps we learned early or and I, I say, we, I am, <laughs> I am the little social butterfly. I want to, I want to work with everybody that comes along. And my, my wife is definitely the one who's like, Hey, we should consider this a little bit more. <laughs> you know, like she's my voice of reason for sure. Yeah, and Jeanette's she's so, like, Hey Chip, hold, hold on just a second. Just, just yeah, a minute. Yep. Okay. We're going to, yeah, hold fire just a bit. I'm like, yeah, but no, it's okay. I know I've already got three weddings this weekend, but these guys are so awesome. She's like, we're, this is not going to work, <laughs> you know? And, and so, uh, no, we've not had a three wedding weekend in a very long time, but no, it's, 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 uh, she is my balance. She's my, my, my reason. She's my uh, slight tug on the reins to make sure that what we're doing, we're doing intentionally and that we're, we're doing in such a way that, that we're just as excited about the next one. Right. It's, it's not been because we got our, our, our butt kicked or got, uh, you know, dragged through the ringer as much as it is. We set off intentionally to make sure that we protected that element so that uh, of, of our business so that we stayed in it. So we, we stayed excited about it and kept loving doing what we were doing. And, and in that regard, we found success there because we still really love doing wedding photography. Well, you're creating something that's sustainable and not only for your business, but then also for your family life, which is a great segue to my next question, which has to do with time. I mean, aside from a more sustainable business model, kind of culling through the potential clients, if you will. Are there sure. other things that you've done in your workflow? And we're going to actually be talking about workflow specifically, so I'm sure we'll get into this in more detail later. But what's one thing that just comes top of mind when it comes to creating a little space in your life for yourself and your family during the week? Yeah, for sure. For me, it's building boundaries. And I'm, I'm not typically a boundaries kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with having the wife and two kids who are now, he'll be 15 next week, and my daughter will be 17 in November. Whoa. Which not too far away from, from your youngins. Yeah. Just, 14 and 17. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, and, and we've been doing wedding photography most of my kids' lives, yep. right? So having boundaries is very important. And, and for me, it's, it's a space to work in, right? So in some seasons, that's been an offsite office or studio where I can drive to do my work for the day and come home. Uh, in other seasons, that's been a room in the house or, or, you know, in the, in the garage where I, where I set up my, my shop, but having a door that I can close at the end of my work day and not open it again until the next day has probably <laughs> in, in more than one way saved my marriage. Yeah. Uh, because I'm, I'm the kind of guy that, you know, we'll be watching TV at, you know, 1030 at night and I'll just like, look over at my laptop and go, huh, wonder if I've got any emails coming in the last couple of hours. And it, it, if I didn't actively set those boundaries, I would be the guy who would reach for the laptop and just bang out some emails. And, and that would take my attention and my time away from my wife right. in those moments or away from my kids in, you know, on a Saturday afternoon. So boundaries, 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 super important for me. So, I, I mean, boundaries, this, this is a, we could do probably even multiple episodes just on this topic <laughs> of boundaries. Can you, and you've, you've kind of alluded to a few, can you give, talk to me about that office space? I mean, did you, you, you mentioned having an offsite space at one point, was there a reason that you brought that home and, and have the home office? What are the pros and cons to each? Sure. Throughout my photography career, we've, we've lived in, in a handful of different houses and, okay. and some facilitated me having an office at home and some did not. And so, uh, and, and in other moments there were, there were friends that, that had, you know, a nice big studio space and like, Hey, I've got a room. Do you want to come move in for a little bit? So it, it's, it's kind of been an ebb and flow based on kind of the situations and, and stuff like that. I currently, uh, office from my home and, uh, 
it's nice because I already pay for it once. Yeah. And I don't, <laughs> so I, I don't mind that. But uh, so yeah, ha- having a dedicated space to work is, is big for me. Uh, another one, man, that, that I didn't realize how important it would be, right? In one of the first seasons where I had moved from an offsite office back to, to my home, to a home office situation, it's, it, it was shocking to me. I forgot how easy it is to wake up in the morning, you know, wash the face, brush the teeth. And then just kind of saunter over to the couch and pick up the laptop, still in pajama pants and a t-shirt. And and you, next thing you know, you look up and it's two p.m. and uh, and I, I got to this point where like probably week two, uh, where I was like, oh my god, I I'm a I'm a professional, I'm a grown man, a father, a husband, and I'm in my pajamas at two in the afternoon. <laughs> this, this got to change. And and uh, I don't know if you follow. There's a there's a comic called The Oatmeal, and he has a great series about working from home and just the utter degradation from from contributing human being part of society to like Neanderthal barely able to put English sentence together. Uh, anyway, it, I, I felt that, and and so I was like, you know what? I am a professional. I would never walk into an office setting in pajama pants and a t shirt. So uh, I have probably the past six years, six, seven years, I've made myself every day, get up, get, get fully ready, put on, put on pants and a shirt, a shirt with buttons and shoes that tie. And th- those are kind of my two, I wouldn't walk into a business meeting without being, without wearing a shirt with buttons and, and shoes that tie. And so the, that's another sort of boundary that I've said. It's like, I'm, I'm a professional. I'm going to get up. I'm going to get dressed. I'm going to do my work. And when I'm done, I'm going to close that door. Some people would revel in, and I mean, and they do, in fact, you'll see it on Facebook, uh, this idea that they can be in their PJs all day. And, and I get the idea. Do you feel like making the effort to get dressed, for example, does that encourage a little bit more structure and discipline elsewhere? Interesting. It, 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 I definitely feel like it makes me more productive okay. uh, in, in that I'm conscious that right now is work time. And when I, when I don't do that, it's easier for me to slip into, oh. well, I'll just, I'll just watch 30 Rock in the background while yep. I'm banging out these emails or processing yep. these wedding. And then, you know, an hour goes by and I've plowed through three episodes of 30 Rock and or, or whatever, pick your NBC comedy show. And so for me, it helps with that structure. It probably, interesting, I, I hadn't really, I guess really thought about it in the context of after work hours, but perhaps that uh, when I've worked from home, it, it, might even help the kids when they when they come home they see that i'm dressed for work it's not dad's playtime it's it is uh okay dad's got to finish up before he can come out and and hang out with us that's yeah good question okay so but i want to go back because you said something that kind of triggered a, a thought for me which was you know you you kind of extrapolate this to other scenarios uh, you hear a lot about people working for in their bed from their bedroom and there is no boundary you talk about the significance of boundaries there's no boundary there on, on one hand, it's detrimental to, if there are any relationships involved, a relationship with a significant other, because now there isn't this kind of space that you go to be, well, even just to rest for that matter, or if you have a significant sure. other to be with this person. And and then because there is no natural boundary created, it is easier, as you're alluding to, to extend the so-called workday anywhere and everywhere. And as opposed to, and I'm just thinking like if, if there is a place that you go to work, if there is a time that you work and coinciding with that, there is a way in which you function, even dress, it then helps encourage this idea of boundaries, which then frees you up to focus in those other environments on whatever is at hand there. So the relationship or rest or otherwise, but a lot of people just mix that. Like the bedroom is a place to work, to sleep, to connect with the partner, to watch a show. Everything just happens all at one place. And you got to wonder how much focus is actually being applied to each of those activities versus creating the separation, creating the boundaries and creating the environment that encourages more, more focus for each. Well, certainly. And, and hear me say as well, I, I, I started my photography career as a husband and a dad, right? My, my kids were born before I started in photography. Uh, lots of folks are in a very different stage of life when they start their career and they may live in an apartment that only really has a bedroom sure. you know, or they may, sure. like their, their situation may not facilitate dedicating space to office. And so I don't mean to preach that the only way to be a professional is to wear this kind of shoe, this kind oh, of shirt, sure. or have this kind of door. But, but I, I definitely, I, I know if I know left to my own devices, I, I, uh, I fix they don't think and I, I dwell and I uh, kind of ruminate. And so it, it might be that I finished something at, you know, at 515 and walked away from it, but I'm still thinking about it at nine. And so the <laughs> more I can do to protect the people I'm with at nine, yep. 
from from my my lesser uh, my my worser impulses of of going and maybe I should have told him that maybe I, wait I, I didn't I didn't reply to that email the way I should have you yeah. know like no you know what that can wait for eight a.m. tomorrow so yeah I'm definitely not saying that, that the boundaries I've set are are what everyone should do but I I would say that but have, having differentiation between the the different uh, maybe times of your day or roles that you play in in the world is important well I, I think we've set uh, I hope that in some way we've set this precedent at the podcast um, previously but none of these statements or many of these statements I should say that we make maybe even most of them aren't meant to be dogmatic um, the reality right. though is there are principles that that we discuss on this podcast and we're coming up on 300 I think at this point uh, episodes recorded a lot of the principle there's a lot of repetition we talk about certain principles pretty consistently through the podcast and we talk about how those principles are implemented in the various lives and businesses of the individuals that we have on the podcast and this is just another wonderful example of that the way that you implement that that principle of creating separation or creating boundaries for your life and for your business chip is is maybe specific to you but the reality is sure. that you know probably 90 95% of those listening in we can all in, and I raise my hand too we can all in some way relate to the reality which is that sometimes it can be tough with all the noise in the world and the easy access to entertainment, uh, which includes social media, by the way, even as much as we like to say that we're doing work there, it, it kind of turns into entertainment. It's as easy as, as it is to get distracted in all those scenarios. We all need in some form or fashion to create some structure and some boundaries. This is something that I'm working on even more for myself as of late, uh, even right now, largely to create more mental space for me too, because it is easy to get distracted or to carry it away and thinking about this thing or that and not being present and, and then consuming so much content too at the same time that how much focus are we actually giving to that and then we encourage a lot of people want to want to put the ADD label on certain behavior but I think in our culture we encourage the mm. tendencies that are sometimes labeled ADD by being able to consume so much content all the time so we're editing and we're watching a show and we're doing this thing and then we're listening to a podcast and we're and it's it's encouraging behavior that minimizes the amount of focus given to the one thing and it kind of pushes aside the possibility that maybe we're trying to drown out some some issues internally that we need to address uh, as well. And that's a whole topic in and of itself. But um, I, I think at the end of the day, these are good principles for all of us to consider. How we implement them is going to look different for everybody, certainly. But I, I really appreciate you sharing those. And, and uh, we're going to talk more about workflow, how to establish a great workflow here in just a little bit. But I want to keep going. Talk to me about a self-help book. Or maybe even a podcast. This is something that has popped up as of uh, more recent episodes as well. But a particular book, a source of education, inspiration that has been particularly impactful for you in the last few years. Sure, I, I actually have two two books that have awesome. been most, most impactful. That's okay. Yeah. The first one uh, is called Rework, and it's by by a guy named Jason Fried. Um, yes. He's one of the founders of Basecamp. Yes, uh, creators of Basecamp. Wonderful book. Yeah, it changed the way I thought about starting a business, about just getting off your can and, and getting work done. And and uh, they actually, side note, had a follow up book called called Remote. Oh, I haven't read that. Have you not? Oh, no. so so our team uh, with the software company, we've got developers in New Zealand, Ohio. I'm in I'm in Texas. We're we're kind of spread out very broadly. And, and the book Remote talked about how their team handled uh, sort of that situation. Anyway, the, those those two were great. Uh, remote was kind of a side mention. But the second book that uh, that I'm really loving right this second, I'm, I'm late to the party, but it's called Start With Why by a guy named Simon Sinek. Yes. Uh, and that one, uh, I'm uh, about 75, 80% through right now. Um, and it, it's... It, Sort of helping me focus and refine the way I think about my businesses, the way I want to position, the way I want to communicate them, zeroing in that, that those points a little bit for me. That's good. Awesome. And, and we'll actually link to all these books in the show notes. For those of you listening in, if you're new to the show, Boca, B-O-K-E-H, podcast.com. Each of these episodes actually have show notes. If you're listening on the, the Apple Podcast app, you can actually click on that episode and you should be able to scroll through the notes as well, see the links but we'll link to these books in the show notes. You should be able to get these books on Amazon pretty easily. I'm glad that you bring up Start With Why, though. And this is something we talk about a lot in the podcast, the significance of having kind of an underlying mission, or sometimes I refer to it as a big picture view that drives everything that we do. And it's actually extremely applicable to the idea of establishing a workflow because how we spend our time day to day is essentially a workflow, right? Um, I'm curious to kind of get your definition on workflow here in just a little bit, Chip, but sure. how we spend our time, there's a tendency, and I'm, I'm certainly guilty of it as well, 
uh, to react to incoming stimuli of one sort or another. Um, and, and that can include email, that can include notifications, you know, text message notifications or social media notifications. That could be phone calls coming in. Uh, that could be a website that you saw that you, you now got to go look at or whatever it might be. But ultimately, what should be driving the way that we establish our workflow, our daily work schedule should be the underlying why. Why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, and really, that should be established on a personal level for our personal lives, which then drives the business model, which then drives how we spend our time. So this book is huge for that, it, well, for no other reason than that, understanding why you do what you do. So if you've not, if anybody listens in, uh, has not read this or is not familiar with the concept, uh, make sure you grab that. There's also a, a YouTube, a TED Talk that Simon did. Uh, we'll link to that in the show notes as well. If you want kind of the Cliff Notes version. Uh, you can check that out. But these are these are great shares. I appreciate that. Talk to me about uh, photography for just a second. The most unusual item in your camera bag. This has been a fun question as of late. And this doesn't have to be a camera or lens or a flash. What's something that comes to mind? Sure. So so I've, I've got three things, and I'll, awesome. I'll uh, do them quick. Number one is a sewing kit. I cannot tell you how many times I've replaced a button for a groomsman or literally sewed a bride into her wedding dress because a clasp broke. Whoa. Uh, so- my, my sewing kit has saved, well, I say that usually my wife is the one. Sewing the <laughs> and I just, you know, there was no judgment there. I was just impressed by this idea that you knew how to do this. This is, this is cool. I'm not saying I can't, I'm just saying that she's better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, yeah, that's item number one. Uh, the second similarly is super glue bridesmaid's earring or high heel uh, that that has a mishap on a wedding day. Okay. Uh, we see all sorts of things. And then lastly, for typically for the groomsmen, I keep a, a, a bartender style bottle opener in my, just a slide it right in. It's like, like this long kind of strip of metal with a hole in the end, yep. throw it in the bag. So, because invariably somebody has the genius idea to bring beers out for the portrait session. And I don't really stop them. It's for those moments when they thought they grabbed the twist off. and didn't. <laughs> So I can, I can play the hero uh, card and on, on any one of those three items, but those, uh, yeah, never, never leave for a wedding without those three things. That's awesome. You know, you mentioned super glue. Somebody uh, in one of the episodes mentioned, they call them glue dots. And I, I don't know, okay. first of all, I'd, I'd even heard of them before, but the, how uh, practical ultimately something like glue could be on a wedding day. I can imagine if you don't have a glue dot, you can just put a dab of super glue on there. That's a really great idea. I think Gorilla Glue is a brand that I might even have here in my apartment somewhere. But regardless, we'll we'll link to um, all of the above or some version of all of the above in the show notes for anybody who just wants to jump over to Amazon and pick something up. We'll make it easy for you. And I appreciate you sharing that again, Chip. Let's sure. let's actually get back to workflow and and kind of our primary focus for today and. Uh, you know, photography, I mean, by the way, for everybody listening in, if, if you're curious about Chip's photographic work, some really beautiful stuff. I was actually scrolling through your Instagram earlier, but if, for those of you listening, and if you go to Chip uh, Gillespie Weddings, and we'll link to this in the show notes, but very quickly, I'll spell it C-H-I-P-G-I-L-L-E-S-P-I-E, and then weddings. Uh, I'll, we'll put that in the show notes and your website as well. Same thing, chipgillespie.com. And we'll link to that in the show notes as well. Beautiful work, Chip. And I don't want to minimize that here in our focus on workflow. But while photography is really cool, obviously, the, the photography business, as I was alluding to earlier, has it just can't be run without a workflow. Even if you've not consciously created a workflow, the reality is what you do on a day-to-day basis is a workflow of sorts. And it may be chaotic and haphazard and, and reactive in nature, but it's workflow. And so... That, it's one thing to have a workflow, but it's another thing then to, of course, ultimately develop an efficient workflow. And that's what I want to talk about today, a manageable, efficient workflow. But before we get into kind of the weeds of that topic, talk to me about your definition of workflow. What comes to mind when you hear that word? Sure. Yes, yeah, certainly. A, a workflow is, is basically a, a set of tasks that gets you from, man, I have a ton of stuff to do, all the way through to job done. Now I can go do something else. Uh, so it's it's sort of everything necessary to get you from from where you are now to where you want to be, whether where you want to be is in a hammock with a cold drink or setting up and experimenting with a new lighting technique yeah. or taking your kids for a bike ride or whatever that is for you. Interesting. Okay. So innate to that idea then is uh, we're talking in most cases about multiple tasks, which 
Uh, we've talked about the idea of or the difference between tasks and projects before in the podcast. There is a significant difference, but most of sure. these things, in order to accomplish them, it requires multiple steps. The question ultimately is how many of those steps can we remove to keep it as simple as possible? And, and then how can we make those individual steps that we are maintaining as effective as possible? Uh, in my mind, when I think about efficiency, that's a, a lot of what I would think about. What, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I think you mentioned it, it just a minute ago that, that your workflow is your workflow, whether you intentionally set it up or whether it just kind of haphazardly came together. Yeah. Right. Like, like sort of a no decision is a decision sort of, sort of notion. Yes. So yeah, lots of people have lots of things in their workflow that they don't know why they're there. They don't know why they do certain things or they don't know why certain steps are there. Either someone recommended it to them or they didn't realize that they could omit or streamline in, in one way or another. But I, yeah, to, to your point, I think it's super important to, to evaluate and, and actively include or omit uh, things based on your your goals, your end result. 100%. And that's my, my mention or the, the, of the significance earlier, actually, of Start With Why, Simon Sinek's book, is for this very reason. That should act as our filter. And if we don't have that filter in place, if we don't know what we're actually trying to accomplish with our personal life and then as a result, our business, then it is very easy to be haphazard and just to, for that workflow to kind of create itself, as you were saying, Chip. And that just puts us in a really chaotic place. And people that are saying, you know, they're working until crazy hours of the night and their inbox is full all the time and, and they don't know how they're going to get everything done. And that doesn't include their personal life. Um, it, it's it's sad to see, but there are ways that we can go about streamlining. Certainly, first of all, understanding why we do what we do, which enables us to clear out the stuff that's just simply not relevant. It's not enabling us to reach those goals. That's a great first place to start. So I'm, I'm glad that you bring that up. But let's let's talk about, first of all, the kind of primary elements of a photography business that even need an established workflow. Because I have to say, you know, workflow, it's not a sexy term. And, and the photography industry doesn't talk about it so much unless we're talking about Lightroom or Photoshop. But sure. the, the reality is we all have a workflow. We need to make it more efficient. We need to understand what elements of our daily workflow we're even talking about here. So what are those? What comes to mind? Well, interesting. As, as I've been thinking through the concept, I, I kind of in my head, uh, it seems like a, a, a functioning photography studio really needs to have sort of three workflows. Okay. Right. And, and, and they, they achieve different goals. They're for different stages in, in each client relationship. And what's interesting to me is they seem to be developed in reverse order. Right. So it seems like photographers get started. They, they, they want to uh, start taking on clients. They, and the first thing they do is they figure out their post-processing workflow. What do you do after you have the photos? Right. So you have a shoot, you bring the photos in and you, you establish steps like download and back up your images, call and sort the images. You do whatever file renaming you do your, your raw conversion and, and, uh, artistic processing, say in Lightroom. Right. Uh, and then you sort out how you're going to deliver your images, whether that be in an online gallery or to your blog or in a, f some a physical media of some sort, like a USB drive for your clients. And that's sort of the last step in the client relationship process, but it, it seems to be the first uh, workflow that photographers establish. Why, why do you think that is? I mean, is it the, is it the piece that is most appealing initially? I, I know that I enjoyed, I, mean, I own an editing company, but I still, and, and of course we're all we're based around this idea that we really shouldn't be spending so much time in front of a computer doing our own editing. Let's delegate that to somebody else so we can focus on the stuff that will drive our business forward. But at the end of the day, yeah. I still love playing in Lightroom with a preset and making the image look pretty. Is, is that the draw? Or why do you think photographers focus on that first? I, I think it has to do with how we as photographers learn what needs to be done, right? Um, so we know that, I, I think we know pretty early on, well, we can't just deliver this raw file. In most cases, our clients can't even open a raw file. But right. especially, it's not finished, it's not polished, it doesn't have our flavor, our brand, our voice in it, right? So the the initial call of the images and, and making selections is super important, as are the uh, the artistic elements, and then the method of you know all the way through to the method of delivery. So once once a photographer seems to have at least a, their head around that, then they realize oh man, I'm getting frustrated because uh, I get to a shoot and I, I don't have all the information I need or there's been miscommunication. And so they realize that, man, I need to establish a, a pre-shoot workflow. And that is the workflow that happens from like sort of initial client contact up to the shoot day. And that involves other things like lead and contact forms, structured emails, questionnaires, consultations, whether they be face-to-face -face or over the phone, 
pricing proposals and quotes, more questionnaires, and, and then even even camera like the day the day of or the day before the shoot, okay. lenses, cards, and that sort of thing. So it, it's sort of as you as you learn more about being a photographer, being in business, you sort of almost work backwards and, and, and fill in those, those gaps from there. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So you're saying most photographers tend to start with the post-production. That's one element of a photography business that needs a, a good and manageable and efficient workflow. The second element is that pre-shoot workflow, which I mean, it, it is, it seems as though if you're looking at it logically, we would first establish that because that's the first thing that we have to do, right? Well, in order of operations, yeah, it needs to happen first. But at least from from my my experience, it seems like it gets developed in a photographer's sort of bag of tricks uh, a little <laughs> bit later in most cases. Okay, so post production, pre shoot workflow. I, am I to assume then that the third element of our business that needs a workflow is the actual day of or the the approach to the shoot itself, or what's the third one? Well, interesting. The third one, it, sort of in my mind, is is the how to get the folks in the door. It's like a marketing workflow. Ah, okay. It's 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 blogging, it's SEO, it's social media, and what's interesting is so yeah that th- those things happen to get the the potential clients to your website to your door, and then once they book with you, you've got the pre shoot workflow, and then of course after the shoot, you've got the the post shoot workflow, but it's all cyclical, right? Because as soon as you're moving through your post shoot workflow of sharing the images of populating your blog of sharing on social media, you're rolling back into the marketing workflow of, of getting your name, the, the awareness campaign, so to speak, of, of getting your, your brand, your name out there. And, and interesting, you mentioned shoot, like the, the shoot workflow. My thinking on that is more that once you're at the shoot, it's kind of your in go time and it, it's, it's less a, it's less a set of steps and it's more about being present. It's more about engaging with, with the, the client, whether yeah. it, a, a wedding day, it, it's, it's being aware, it's looking for story and it, it's telling the story. It, it's in certain moments, it, it's posing and directing and, and, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I, I had, I wasn't thinking that, I guess I don't really have a, a shoot day workflow as much as I have the, the other three. In, in no, my, uh, but that makes sense though, because the reality is, especially for wedding photographers or event photographers, as well as we know what it's like to shoot most weddings, they don't necessarily always go the same way. And, oh, and definitely. I, yeah. And I like the, the point that you make about being present, right? I mean, you've, you've taken the time to establish a skill set as a photographer. Hopefully you know how to handle most lighting scenarios. So when you get kind of pushed into a situation that you maybe weren't even totally expecting, you're present, you're focused, you go with the flow, you make it work. I Ooh. loved the challenge of showing up. I mean, I, I shot a range of weddings. I started at three, three fifty uh, for my first wedding and I lost money on that and then worked up to the shooting $10,000 weddings. And I, so that was a range. And especially in this local Chattanooga market, that, that was a lot of money as, at the end. But during during that range of 10 plus years of shooting weddings, I was in a scenario or scenarios quite a few times that were less than ideal. And the challenge of you know turning a, let's say, a, a not so great looking church or venue of some kind, turning that into a beautiful photo shoot by finding one particular place that had really great lighting and a halfway decent background and focusing on capturing real emotion and you'd never have known that that kind of challenge was really, really fun for me. But it's that that involves, as you're saying, being present, being aware, being focused. But let's get back to the three kind of primary elements, sure. the workflow elements that you talked about. And I'm going to reverse them uh, for the sake of conversation, because it seems that maybe we should, you know, we should mark it first to draw the client in. Now we've got the client. We have a pre-shoot workflow. And then after we shoot, we have that post-production. So let's start with marketing. And and sure. I, I don't know, maybe you have principles that are applicable to all three. What are What are the driving principles that... Uh, a photographer should implement in these three elements of their daily or weekly workflow that will help make them more manageable? Sure. The first one that comes to mind, and, and you mentioned it uh, a little higher up in the, in the, uh, the conversation, but efficiency is key. Using your time wisely, whether it's on the marketing side of things, whether it's in your pre-shoot communications, whether it's in your post, in, in your artistic and, and uh, your photography post-production, being efficient with your time, using your time well is super important. You have to streamline. You have to stay focused. Like you mentioned, you, you, we need to omit uh, unnecessary steps and, and really, as much as possible, keep it to bite-sized chunks. 
uh, especially for photographers who are at the stage of their career where they're really ambitious. They're really they're like, I, I want to do 40 weddings a year. Man, nothing, nothing against that. That's amazing. If you've got the energy and, and, and if your business is structured that way, go get it. But especially if you are maxed out at, at capacity for your weddings, you have got to be efficient in your workflows. Let's make it even more practical. So we're talking about the idea of efficiency. Not, I think a lot of photographers that are running a business and they're like, all right, I need to somehow save time. I get the idea. I understand the definition of efficiency, but I don't know how to actually make that happen in my, uh, let's say, email management, for example. What does it mean to make my email workflow more efficient? Or what does it mean to run a Facebook ad more efficiently? You mentioned the idea of removing unnecessary steps. Are there any other components of this idea of efficiency that you think are important? Yes. And, and, and I'll, if it's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll drop a, a friend's name here. Yeah. Uh, our, our mutual friend, Jenny Corbett, uh, yes. sort of revolutionized my, my thinking in, in the specific to the, the pre-shoot workflow communication, right? Communication is key. You've, you've got to Every client, whether you've got four or 40, needs to feel like they're an important part of, of your world, right? But but sitting down and t- 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 typing out long-winded emails for every, you know, once a week leading for nine months leading up to a wedding, you, no, nobody's got the kind of, nobody can devote the kind of time to that and still do the other things they need to do. So she was really instrumental in helping me think about how I was communicating with my clients, things like how my emails were structured, how I pre-formatted the things I could pre-format, how I would even trigger reminders and alerts of six weeks before the wedding. Let's, let's schedule a time to sit down together in the next two weeks to talk about timeline and shot list. And, you know, before it's, you know, the closer you get to the wedding, the, the, the more hectic things are for bride and groom. So like uh, to structure, you know, the, the timeline of when things happen, I actually use a, um, an online studio management system, which helps to streamline uh, some of those elements like the emails and the communication schedule and stuff like that. And for me, being able to sort of take that out of my brain and put it into, uh, into a software system or, you know, a, an online service was just I had no idea how necessary it was before I started doing it. And then once I got in that system, I was like, Oh my gosh, I can, I can breathe and and nothing's falling through the cracks because I've, I've set this up intentionally and it's, it's doing its thing. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm just making notes here as we're talking efficiency, the idea of efficiency. First of all, we're talking about the significance of removing unnecessary steps. What is not absolutely necessary in order to accomplish that task or set of tasks. So we want to do that first. And then the importance of taking the time ahead of time, uh, a la Jenny Corbett. Jenny's an incredible, incredible person. I don't know. I don't, we haven't had her on the podcast yet somehow, and, and we absolutely need to. But Jenny, this, this idea of designing a system in advance, which means you're actually taking the time to think through it rather than just mm-hmm. reacting to whatever is happening in the moment, which is, again, where we end up in this kind of chaotic, haphazard state where we're running very inefficiently. We've taken the time ahead of time to put a system in place that enables us to get the thing done more quickly, particularly leveraging tools um, like we see in our industry right now, CRMs that enable us to automate communication or to pull from templates and communicate more efficiently in that way, more quickly that way. That's in, that's important. So the two important components to efficiency, remove unnecessary steps, design a system, take the time ahead of time to design a system. This is good. Okay, so talk to me about another principle that enables us to more eff- effectively manage these three components of our workflow, post-production, or actually I'll reverse it, marketing, pre-shoot workflow, and post-production. Sure. Uh, the second one for me is to maintain your brand. And, and, and uh, what I mean is to, to use your time wisely and intentionally, right? So while we want to offload certain tasks that don't require us, there are certain elements of maintaining our brand that are, that is, that are absolutely essential that we put our hands on, right? It's like, for example, if a photographer's brand is built around a very specific artistic look, Right. If, if it's, if it's their blood, sweat, tears, they, they touch every image in Lightroom, then, then they need to make sure that they, that they spend time on their, on their artistic processing to make it look exactly like they want to. For other photographers, and, and I'll talk about myself a little bit, what my clients know about my images is that when they look at them, they, they can feel them. They can feel the emotion. They can, they can read the excitement, the, the sorrow, the, the calm, whatever is, is present in the photos. They, they feel like that's something that is a big draw for them. So for me, one thing that I could never outsource is the initial sort of, an image, of images from a wedding day. 
And, and I spend a lot more time at that than I do at other parts of my post-production workflow because I want to make sure that the images that I choose convey that emotional story. And now for me, I, I uh, <laughs> interesting, I used to be uh, very averse to the notion of, of outsourcing my post-production. But as I've gotten, as I've refined my brand and who I am as a photographer, I've realized that I can communicate with someone else. Here's what I want my images to look like. And I can outsource that bit. So I'm not spending days and I'm really not, I, I'm not efficient time-wise in Lightroom. It takes me a lot longer than it should. So the way I preserve my brand is to be very, is to spend my time on the selection and then to to do the 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 artistic processing efficiently whether that's outsourcing or or uh, other things but but it's deciding what's right for you right like if 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 a photographer is very much about a specific look then what's not right for them probably is to hit a button on a preset and make all their photos look a certain color tone or or way they need to spend that time uh making sure their images look look the way they want them to so it it's it's unique to each photographer, it's unique to each studio, but but it's making those decisions intentionally. Which what what requires my time and attention, and what can I, uh, what can I expedite? Okay, so when you say maintaining your brand, I, I when I hear the word maintain, and I'm kind of a literal guy, so I hear maintain, and and I think about like this idea of maintaining control, which in my mind kind of seems almost the opposite of getting freedom of of being more manageable because I'm trying to control all of these different things. But I guess really what you're talking about is focusing on the things that are a reflection, a reflection of your brand, the things that are most important to the maintenance of your brand, focus your time on those, and then you can kind of give up the rest. Is that right? Yes. And, and, and really, it's, it is about control. It is about keeping your hands on the things that need to be on. Uh, one of the things early in our business that, that my wife and I, I won't say fought, but we kind of had some extended conversations about. <laughs> extended um, conversations. I like that. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we just we may have gone round and round about it. Uh, it was about communication. And, and what I, what I wanted here, here's a little peek behind the curtain. What I wanted was for each of our voices to be present in our outgoing messages, our emails and that sort of thing to our clients. I wanted them to hear from both of us. What I also wanted was for Jeanette to write exactly what I would have written if I were writing the email. <laughs> right. Right. So that, that, that's a, that's a deficiency of mine. So I I would, I had a hard time letting go of that piece and, and trusting that whatever she wrote was going to be right because it's her voice and it's our voice and, and it's, it's not my voice and that's okay. Right. So it, um, it took me a more time, uh, an amount of time that I'm embarrassed to say, uh, to get comfortable with, with releasing that. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly, uh, control freak about certain things. And I'm, I've learned in, in later years to release some of those things, but for our business, for me, I can, I could release some of those, uh, those outgoing message things because I'd trust that Jeanette was going to do, uh, do the, the thing that would be our, our collective voice, but I still held tightly to image selection, right. And going back to that thing. So maintaining the brand for me was, yeah, I, I still want to, I still want to be very precious about certain elements and learn to be less precious about other elements. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I'm still going back to um, to focusing on what matters most to the brand uh, because, again, the idea of of maintaining. I, I'm thinking, you know, if if we're going to encourage the the idea of manageability, a part of the issue with a lot of photographers is that I mean, you, you even alluded to it, Chip, and certainly I've been guilty of it, ironically as well in my efforts or lack of efforts to delegate when I really should have been. I've experienced, you know, here I am running a company that is all about delegation, outsourcing editing, but ultimately that's delegation, right? You're handing some, a task over to somebody else to do. And, and yet I wasn't internally with my team delegating the way that I should have. I was still trying to maintain too much control for one reason or another. And in recent months, I've had the, the wonderful luxury, really, because I have such a great team, of being able to delegate more than I ever have. And it's freed me up and it's, it's helped encourage growth in our company. It's amazing what it's actually translated to. But what, what it meant was I have to be clear about the direction of our company. I have to certainly be clear about what our brand stands for. How we get there doesn't have to look exactly the way that I think it should look. There are different ways to get to the overarching set of goals, our mission, right? And so learning to to give up 
the control, give up control really of the nuances and learning to kind of pick my battles, if you will, focusing on what's most important, then frees me up to have more time to focus on some of the other bigger picture things. And, or in my case, to focus on starting another company, even that is, sure. that has enabled me to, to have a much more manageable work life. And I'm, I'm even literally as we speak this week, um, this is something that I'm further implementing in our team's dynamic in our in our company culture, if you will. And I think it's going to turn into something really, really great. So maintaining our brand, certainly we need to make sure we maintain the significant, most significant elements of our brand that can't be compromised or shouldn't be compromised because they're a reflection of our overarching goals. But learning how to give up a little bit, delegate a little bit, those things that aren't as important to that, I think that's a really good piece of advice. And again, you're setting an example for us. I appreciate that. So efficiency and and efficiency, of course, we talked about involves removing unnecessary steps and taking the time to actually design a system up front. It takes a little bit of a time investment, but design a workflow up front that will enable you to get that work done more efficiently along the way. Secondly, maintaining your brand or focusing more specifically on the important elements of your brand so that you can delegate, let go of some of the others. What's the third one? Well, so yeah, it, to your point that you just made it, my third one is you are not Superman. You, you, you <laughs> can't do everything. And, and so, um, yeah, I, I mentioned uh, just a minute ago, I, I used to be so afraid of, of the notion of outsourcing anything. I don't, I didn't want to give control. I wanted to touch every image. I wanted to write every email. I wanted to do every meeting. I want you know, every little thing. And I think that's a real good way to set yourself up for burnout. Yep. So do the bits you love and let someone else do the bits you don't do the bits that require you and delegate or outsource or offload the bits that don't require you. Uh, and I mentioned before, I, I no, no one else can pick images for me. I have to, as long as I'm a photographer, I'll have to be the one to make the image selections. Sure. But there's lots else that I can, that I can free myself up from so that either a, I, I can hang with my wife and kids especially you know my kids before they graduate and they're out of my house good lord i'm old or or be just you know further my business by by spending other time doing marketing things or uh, or learning new skills or taking a class or you know attending a workshop those sort of bits that's good yeah and and really uh, you you've said it all there there's nothing to add to that and and ultimately we all have the opportunity to be able to find a little bit more freedom in our life and i can just say from personal experience and very recent experience at that it's not just about freedom it's it's the opportunity for your company to to scale which means that you can grow without as you were saying chip burn yourself out without burning yourself out but it you have the opportunity to grow when you're willing to let go of control and let other people come along who have strengths that maybe you don't who can enable your brand to grow can help your brand to grow and uh and and you don't have to be stressed out along the way it's a brilliant a brilliant thing you know you you are we're talking about workflow here you're a photographer to to begin with but You've designed uh, and been in, involved in designing software for another brand that you helped start, um, Stomp Software. And I'd love for you to just share a few, uh, just for a few minutes here about Stomp, uh, the significance of Stomp when it comes to designing an efficient workflow, uh, if you will. Sure, sure. Um, so we started, uh, we started the company in 2009. Our mission then is what our mission is now. It's It's to help take some of the the larger, heavier, bulkier, more time-intensive workflow tasks and streamline them. So in, 20, uh, in 2009, we launched a product called Blog Stomp, and it was a, a workflow tool that would help to prepare uh, your high-res images for use on, on your blog. Uh, as your primary marketing platform, it's, it's pretty important that you, uh, that you keep your blog updated, that it works hard for you. But what we found was uh, photographer after photographer that we would talk to was spending hours and hours a week in resizing individual images and adding a bit of a sharpening action, <laughs> maybe putting an order around it, yep. dropping, a, dropping a, a watermark logo on top and then saving it. And that's for one image. And then they go on to the second image. Uh, and, and, you know, when you're, if you're posting 20, 30, 40, 80 images from a wedding, man, can this eat up your time? So blog stomp was a method by which uh, photographers could 
could free up just a ton of their time in, in making this process, reducing this process to just a handful of clicks. Yeah, I remember I, I used to have, actually, I think it's still in there somewhere, a Photoshop action that was a combination of <laughs> maybe something like a combination of recipes that would pull that image in. And it's funny you mentioned borders because that used to be a thing too. You put these borders oh, yeah. around your image, maybe put a watermark in that border and of course resize it, sharpen it a little bit. And I used to have this, this action that we would run for our blog images. But the idea that you could just pull that into the software and it would do the work for you is awesome. Sure. Well, and, and, and yeah, Blogstomp definitely started as a, a set of actions for Photoshop. In in 2011, we added a, a software developer to the team and we broke Blogstomp out of uh, out of Photoshop and it became a standalone software app for the first time. That's great. And, uh, yeah. And, and, and just, just all through every, every iteration, every innovation has been for the purpose of making a, a, a handful of, of tedious tasks easier and quicker so that you don't spend all your time just on the menial stuff, but you get to free yourself up to, to get back to doing what, what you want to be doing, what you need to be doing, what you love doing. But you guys didn't stop with Blogstomp. Now you've got two other pieces of software, right? That's right. In, uh, in 2014, we released an album design tool called Album Stomp, which uh, early in Blogstomp's life, we created the ability to, to group images together and build little collages. Uh, and so Album Stomp, technology kind of is built on Blogstomp's initial uh, collaging feature. So you can drop a handful of images into an album spread and it'll automatically sort of lay out your design for you. And you can, th- there's a little mix it up button so you can cycle through different layouts and, and, uh, and then you can also have the fine tune control of drag and drop and, and tweak the design, customize it on your own. Uh, I mentioned before, I think uh, a couple of times that I'm a bit of a control freak, you know, earlier in, in my career, I had tested with some sort of some template based uh, album design software and it just didn't feel like a fit. I couldn't, I couldn't make it what I wanted it to look like. And so when we built album stomp, a big priority for me was to streamline the design process by making it easy and automating certain elements, but also maintaining the the custom control, giving the photographer the ability to, to make tweaks, make, make adjustments and, uh, and do some of that, that stuff on their own as well. Yeah. Cause that, that process of designing albums. Now I, I, I have to be transparent here. I haven't photographed weddings full time since 2012, or that was the last time I actually photographed a paid wedding for a paid wedding client. But I, I know that back in the day, the idea of designing a an album was quite a tedious process. In fact, my business partner at the time ended up kind of taking over that process. I think probably largely because I was such a perfectionist about it. It was taking me way too much time. <laughs> the idea that you can have a piece of software that essentially does the work for you and you just tweak it as necessary is pretty awesome. And then when I first started doing weddings, we were designing in Photoshop. Yeah. And so we, uh, we would open up a, an album spread and we would open up, you know, five or a, up to a dozen images and we would resize them individually and lay them out. And then we realized, Oh, that that's not really the right size. Okay. Let me back out of here. Let me rechange the size again. And man, this, these two aren't lining up. Oh my God. It would be a day and a half to design an album yeah. in some cases. And, uh, uh, it's it's been it's been really great to hear stories from people literally all over the world who have used our software tools and have, have taken day and a half tools and 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 reduced the time requirement to a half an hour an hour you know like radically changing their their workflow and, and their their work life. Wow. Okay. So then album stomp, yeah, blog stomp, album stomp, and then album proofer. What's it, do you kind of take the finished product from album stomp into album proofer? Sure. So Album Proofer is a, it began as a companion tool to Album Stomp. It's, it's a cloud-based, it's an online album proofing solution. Basically, uh, I know, I know lots of studios, they'll, they'll get uh, their clients to make, to pick 80 images and they'll design an album out of that and they'll print it without a lot of feedback from the client. My, my notion has always been, I want my client to have a hand in the design process and, and to help and to revise and to make selections and make changes. Album Proofer allows you to upload the album design directly from Album Stomp. There's a little feedback section. They can leave notes. Uh, they can, you can view all the album spreads in a beautiful, clean interface and they can leave feedback like, you know, the, the image on the left-hand page, replace it with 519 or, you know, or swap these two images around, or I love this spread, but let's make it all black and white. 
And so that way, when I open up Album Stomp the next time, I see their notes right there linked to each uh, album spread. I can make the changes quickly and re-sync it to the website, and then they'll get a notification that they can go and either make further comments or approve the design. And it, man, it just, uh, we used to email PDFs across and people would yep. print them out and make markups on them and <laughs> mail them back or, or send us back scans or photos. And, and it was just a mess. You get those things out of order and it's like, well, you, will you rearrange anything? order of the album or did you mistakenly put number six <laughs> in number 12 spot anyway this this helps to it keeps it all in one place then after a little several months after we released album proofer we had lots of folks saying hey we're looking for a proofing solution like this but we we're already our, our workflows in a different album design tool uh, you know can can we use album proofer with our album design tool so we we thought about it we considered some options and we we went ahead and created an album proofer standalone software app for desktop so if you design in a different album design tool whether it's indesign or fundy or smart albums you can still use album proofer to proof your albums it's a very quick easy upload you still have the the preformatted uh, or or editable email messaging for the clients the comments are, are still uh you can you can view the comments and have your conversation that way uh with your clients about revisions and so if your workflow doesn't include album stomp it can still have a, a very effective and beautiful and uh, affordable proofing solution in hand there and then you can push those out to i mean do you have a list of album companies that you can push those out to as well Yes, we do. We we have the album design specs for goodness, I lost count between eighty and a hundred uh, album album companies uh, built into Album Stomp, so that if you are designing a book for pick your album company, whether it's Kiss or Leather Craftsman or White House or Miller's or Madeira Books or any number of other any number of book companies, you can build to their design specs, so that when you export your files. And, and send it to the album company, you'll know the photographer will be confident, the album company will be confident that everything is right per their, their design requirements and, and you won't have any, uh, any oopsies after the, the book's been printed. That's awesome. Well, it, for everybody listening, especially those that you that have listened to the podcast for a while, you know that we don't do commercials. And anytime that I um, have somebody on the podcast and talking about a product, we're, we're not being paid to do this. And in fact, I have a lot of respect for chip. And so I certainly welcome the opportunity to be able to share this, this uh, software, this software suite really with you listening in. If, if these solutions seem like something that'd be a good fit for your business, make sure you go check them out. We'll link to Stomp Software in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. And then Chip, if you'll just briefly one more time, share all the other important URLs of social media, websites, et cetera, for our listeners so they can follow you online. That'd be awesome. Sure, certainly. Uh, all the all the most pertinent information is available at stompsoftware.com. That's S-T-O-M-P-S-O-F-T-W-A-R-E.com. Also, any of our software apps are available in a free trial. So you can kind of give them a try, road test them, see if they feel like a fit. The, the overarching reason behind everything we do, our why, is to make photographers' lives easier. Uh, and so we like, thank you for letting me talk about these. I, I, I wasn't coming on to, to pitch software as much as to have a conversation about workflow with you, but thank you for letting me mention them. I, I uh, my hope is that photographers would find whatever solution is right for them to, to streamline their workflow, to give them a better quality of life as photographers so that they stay in it and keep wanting to do it. And if our tools can help with that, amazing. Uh, we've got a great support team that's ready to answer questions and we, we try to keep our price points affordable to photographers in all stages of, of their career. So have, have a look at the website again, that's stompsoftware.com, or you can follow along on Instagram or Facebook, just search up stomp software and you'll find us there. Cool. And, and you can also follow chip uh, and his photography work too. If you just go to chip Gillespie weddings, uh, com for the site and on Instagram, we'll link to those in the show notes as well. This is again, the conversation is a reflection of, uh, is a great reflection actually of what Boca is all about. Uh, or so much about, which is, as you were saying, Chip, to to encourage more time and space in photographers' lives. It, yeah. our, our businesses are a fun, challenging, interesting thing to do, and hopefully it's making us a living as well. But at the end of the day, there's more than life that, to, to do, or there is more to life than work, very simply. And yeah. um, cool. And if we are, in some form or fashion, able to create more manageable, more efficient workflows for ourselves, it means that we have more space to do things besides work. Uh, if nothing else, 
go up, spend a little bit more time with the important people in your life, your kids, your significant other, your other friends or family, make the time to actually connect with somebody in person. And it's these kinds of tools and these principles ultimately that enable us to have more time for what really can't be replaced, those relationships in our life. So thanks again for making time for Boca, Chip, for sharing with us today. Really, really appreciate it. Absolutely, man. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Milu the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit Milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com. dot